low cost medical devices and securing international grants, including support from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. His advocacy for integrating artificial intelligence into neurological research and education has earned him numerous awards, including the American Academy of Neurology Resident Research Award. Dr. Das has also received accolades for his contributions to neurology, notably the Glow Health Tech Prototyper Award for developing an AI-powered chatbot for neurolog neurological disorders. While he could not be with us in person, Dr. Das will be joining us virtually from the UK. We are honored and grateful to have you here with us, sir. If members of the audience have questions during the talk, kindly note them down with their names and give them to the volunteers around you. We begin the session now, sir. The stage is all yours. Good morning from UK. Thank you for the kind invitation. Can you allow me to share my screen? Thank you. I think everyone is able to see my screen. Yes, sir, we can see your screen. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for the kind invitation. So the topic of the talk is in, was an interest of me since childhood, and it is increasingly becoming my area of active research. So we'll discuss about what we call the so-called non-ordinary states of consciousness. So before we go, before we start that, we know we human are contemplative animals. We like to think. So once we secure our basic security thing. So we start to uh, ideate on one thing. This is Bonkim Chandra Chatterjee, the pioneer of modern Indian literature. He asked it very succinctly. What should I do with my life? In Bengali, Jimon Luya Kikori Go. Now, this is the question that starts all this journey. So if we look around, the most common answer is finding happiness. However, and, and everywhere from the internet to the gurus everywhere, they're providing you the answers with how to find happiness. But if you look carefully, you'll see is happiness is only one of the six, six cardinal emotions, and it occupies only a narrow part of our entire emotional repertoire. And as per the other modern understanding is only one of the 27 of our human emotions known. So should happiness be a target? It was very, again, very succinctly put or asked in a 2015 movie by Disney from Inside Out, where happiness is one of the key emotions. And there are certain other emotions, so-called negative emotions. And the movie beautifully showcases how all the emotions are helpful in certain point of life. The other problem with happiness is that what we call so-called the hedonic treadmill. Uh, the concept was formed in 1971 back in Brickman and Campbell that our human mind has a tendency to normalize or adapt to everything. After it, something gives us happiness, it becomes normal. Same thing with sadness or joy. Then a classic study, they studied individuals winning a lottery and also individuals who had paralysis and showed them after some time, both of them, their happiness uh, becomes almost near to the baseline. So this is one as hedonic treadmill. You accumulate things, do something, gives you happiness. Later, it doesn't give you happiness. You have to keep on doing it more and more and more. But your happiness doesn't increase. And also shown by this study nicely that if you value happiness more, you may not get the happiness when you get it. That's been proven by one of the studies. So ideally, happiness should not be a target. So Bonkim returns again, asking the same question. So what should we do? Now, to our rescue, we have got a guy called Abraham Maslow, the, the father of so-called positive psychology. He gave us some idea. So his concept is, is uh, the pyramid of need. And the journey starts. First, we secure our physiological needs, safety. Then comes what we need, the other things, love, belonging, self-esteem. And the ideal need is self-actualization. If you look carefully, the cultures, the religions, the philosophies across the world have also asked the question. And there are three classic answers. Sir, uh, so they, they... really sorry to interrupt you. Uh, we seem to have, we are having a small technical issue. Uh, would you mind pausing for this five minutes? Uh, we okay. may have to re restart. Is that okay with you? Okay, uh, since fine. we have a fairly large audience in the auditorium, there was a small technical snag. Okay. 
I'm so sorry for that. Okay. I hope that's okay with you, sir. That's fine. Should I go back from the start? Yes, we can go to the beginning of the slide and okay. uh, we can have the intro. Okay, sorry everyone, I'm going to restart it. No, 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 uh, my apologies, so just some technical issue. Uh, I'll just give you the uh, game flag in uh, about 10 minutes and then we can begin. Really great. Okay, thank you. If possible, yes, thank you so much. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. So starting again. So is am I audible to everyone? And can everyone see my screen? I need a confirmation. Yes, you are audible. Yeah. Hello. Okay, so good morning from UK. Um, and pleasure to talk to you today on this topic. So we have lost some time. So I'll be a little bit faster in some of the slides. Apologies for that. So thank you for the invitation. And this is increasingly becoming my area of uh, research. As we know, all humans are contemplative animals. The moment we're born, we start thinking what to do with our life after we secure our basic needs. And this uh, this gentleman, uh, Bonkim Chandra Chatterjee, who, is, who painted the lyrics of Bande Mataram, he put it very succinctly in Bengali. What should I do with my life? And that's a big question. So we look around, the one of the commonest answer is find happiness. Find happiness and you will be happy. But is that true? Because if you look carefully, is happiness is one only one of the six cardinal emotions as promoted by uh, Ekman basic emotion theory or among the emotions uh, gradients, it only occupies one end of the emotional spectrum. We look more carefully, there are now we are, know there are around 27 emotions and happiness is only one of them. So should happiness be a target? It, this question was put and answered very succinctly by a Disney movie back in 2015 called Inside Out. But happiness is one of the key emotions, but all other emotions have their role. Although some of them so-called negative emotions, they have also th their role. The other issue is that the called hedonic treadmill because of our brain's tendency to normalize everything. So after some time, everything has a tendency to regress to normal. Either you win a lottery, big emotional boost, 
or you get paralysis. This was put forward in 1971, and then one of the classic studies back that time they showed people are winning lottery or getting a paralysis after some time that happiness is returning near to the baseline. The other issue is that the more you look for happiness is one of the marker. You get less happy when you get the target. So ideally, happiness should not be a target. So again, Bong Kim returns with this question. So what should he do? So one person comes to a rescue. His name is Abraham Maslow, the father of current positive psychology. And he tells us, OK, it is a pyramid, so-called the Maslow's uh, pyramid of need. And you grow along the pyramid. The first, you meet your basic needs, your safety, acquire friend, family, and then get your own esteem. And then what he called self-actualization, morality, creativity, spontaneity, problem seeking. So it gives us a structure. Now, if we look around from the centuries since the human has become uh, cognizant, we're trying to solve this question. And the different societies at different time have provided their own answers. So from the Greek concept of eudaimonia to the Indian concept of Ananda and the Buddhist concept, which spread out from India and also but gained other significant meaning in China and Japan, the concept of nirvana, it presents profoundly distinct perspective. Now, this concept origins from diverse cultural and philosophical backgrounds, but their core answer is same. Answer for human happiness and fulfillment. And they are more of disposition, what you need to be rather than what you do. And this is the distinction from the other Western analytical philosophical traditions. So the Kantianism is one profound of them. So they're different. Now, as we know, there are other societies, they also try to produce their own answer. They're somewhat different from this classic answer. So for example, Shavinda Huantar, one of the earliest site of Peruvian civilization, we get this uh, stele or a structure of a person in their one of the main temples holding a cactus. And that this cactus is important. It is the Trichogerus macrogonus, the source of mescaline. We'll come to it. It's one of the active psychedelic agents and they were the key part of the social, social structure. The other people tried like the shamanism of the Mongolian shamanism or the shamans of the animistic society throughout the world is the use of trance. So throughout the century, people either promoted meditation, use of psychedelics or use of trance and other things to answer the question of human flourishing. Now, just basic look at the eudaimonia, the, the classic structure of human flourish is, is that you take responsibility you live with virtue. Now, the concept of the arete or the virtue is different from the English word virtue. You live with each day, do what best you can do, and focus on what you can control. This was proposed by Aristotle, same time he said with Plato. So it basically not only good character, but rational activity. And you have to be fully engaged in the intellectually stimulating and fulfilling work at which one achieves well and success. But the Greek philosophers, they discussed a lot of other things, but stopped a little bit short how to get it done. Here, our Eastern philosophies are much more developed. They give us a clear, almost a very clear guideline what to do. Now for this next slide, I'm thankful to my uh, colleague, uh, Professor R. Mitra. He's a pulmonologist in SSK in Calcutta. He provided me the slide. He's an authority in Vedantic, and he's also a very acclaimed poet. So in Indian, concept of the concept of ananda, the bliss, or sat chit ananda. So we start from the matter, then we structure into our mind, then we go to our beyond mind, beyond our own self. So you can see from Vedanta philosophy, tantric philosophy, yogic philosophy, and later all will combine together by um, Aurobindo Ghosha, Rishi Aurobindo, this concept of the super mind of the Uttimanas, and they have all the similar structure. After that, you cross yourself, you part of the commune, or you get to the target of the Brahman, or the Atman and the Brahman becomes the same, the oneness. Now the Buddhist philosophy is a little bit different, but almost similar, where they call the Nirvana, because their concept of, because they, they decline the existence of a changeless soul. For them, everything is changeable, everything is anitya. So for the Buddhist philosophy, from Four Noble Tools, the Eightfold Path, the main three marks are the impermanence, non-self, and the dukkha. So to get away from the dukkha, you need to get nirvana. And here is the concept of no mind, where you have direct relationships. So your mind doesn't exist. Mind doesn't filter out things. 
it is the very similar to the concept of non-self, anatman. So here the Buddhist philosophy differs from the concept of the bliss or dhananda, but they're almost similar. But what we see from all these philosophies is their focus on meditation. Now here comes the brain, because I'm a neurologist, I'm bound to bring our brain in the picture. Now here comes the most complex of organ system that have developed is the brain. It's a very complex network. It says around 100 billion neurons equal to the number of stars in our galaxies. Each neuron has around 7,000 synapses. So the child has actually more, the synapses uh, get down as we age. So one quadrillion synapses to 100 to 50, 100 to 500 trillion synapses. And the possible connections are more than all stars in the entire observable universe. So we're actually more complex than the universe. And as if you can say, okay, we are the universe that has been told us previously, we're the part of the universe. Now, how we understand the connection is very important. We'll uh, deal it because we'll come in it later. So the connections can be structural. One part of the brain is connected to the other part of the brain by heart matter pathways. The structure can be functional. So one part of the brain while working, they also work with other part of the brain. We call it functional connectivity. And the connection can be effective, which means one part of the brain, how they get activated affects the other part of the brain. It, it can either increase the activation or decrease the activation. We call it effective connectivity. So there are structural connectivity, there are functional connectivity, and there are effective connectivity. Now, through these connections, the different brain regions are organized together. So they are what we call rich club organization. So there is one, there are some part of the brain, some group of neurons will come to it. There's areas called insula, precuneus, frontal lobes. They are densely connected with the other part of the brain compared to the, some other part of the say, occipital lobe. They are not densely collected like precuneus. Precuneus connected to almost all part of the brain. Now they are also locally connected. Say occipital lobe, it has local integration and they have global integration. So frontal lobe through this rich club organization, they're connected to many, many other parts of the brain and it can affect the other actions of the other part of the brain. So we call it global integration. And these connections based on how they're interacting, we call them modules. So we know that human brain is modular. One group of brain focuses on one activity. So they're specialized and they're redundant, but there's always, there is some other group that can take over the activity. They're overlapping. The connections are shared between different groups and they're hierarchical. So one group takes precedence over the other. Now the modules, we are understanding more of these modules we use. This is the structural connectivity, functional connectivity, and how they're organized. And we are seeing actually these modules are preserved throughout the evolution of the structure of the brain. Although we get some new modules like our cognitive modules, which are absent in the lower animals, but the structure of the modules are more or less preserved. So there is a value in their evolution. The modules are precious and they do something that's why they're preserved over the evolution. Now we come to the brain circuits. I'm discussing this bit in detail because I'll talk a lot about brain circuits. So they're from about the salience network where we can have our understanding what is important, the limbic network, network for our emotion, regulation, fear extinction, the dorsal attention network, altered goal-directed attentional mechanisms, and ventral attentional network, stimulus-driven attentional mechanisms, cognitive control, what we plan, motor planning, or executive control, what we're going to things. So all these things are so-called brain circuits. There's a combination between connectivity and our modularity of the brain. And they are again quite robust from person to person. So we call them our circuits that do different kinds of jobs. Now we have many tools to understand these circuits. First of foremost, what we call the functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI. So we put a person in the MRI scanner, we do the MRI. Now we ask them to do some tasks. When they do some tasks, some of the part of the brain get activated. We can see them. Now, if we average across the task versus not doing the task, when we take out the non-doing the task, we only the part of the brain that we're doing the task remains. So we can see them light up in the scans by some statistical jugglery. And now we know which part of the brain is active for that kind of task. So this is the basic of functional magnetic resonance imaging. You can see the brain in action, real time. Next comes the EEG. We put some electrodes on our scalp 
and study the electrical activity, we can collect the electrics and find which part of the brain are working or not working. Again, EEG based mapping provides a lot of information how the brain is working. Then comes the diffusion tensor imaging, what we call the structural imaging, this one. And then comes the positron emission tomography. It produces our answer about how, what is brain doing metabolically. So because brain is very metabolically active, takes up glucose. So which part of the brain is doing the work, takes up glucose more, which is doing less, takes up glucose less. So based on that, we can understand which part of the brain is working. So by combination of these usual, these four techniques, we can understand both structurally, functionally, and metabolically what the brain is doing. And this is our basic of our understanding of the current connectivity. But we will be frank with you, we are basically still the proverbial six blind men looking at the elephant. So where does, if you ask me, where does the mind lives in the brain? I'll, I'll tell you, okay, somewhere in between them, but exactly where, I do not know. So all the neurologists, psychiatrists, psychologists, and cognitive neuroscientists, we are basically like the proverbial blind men. We're looking at the elephant, but some is looking at the spear, some is finding a snake, some is finding a rope, and some is finding a wall, and we are still to solve it out. So with this caveat, let's go deeper. How to use our brain to achieve the so-called bliss, the holy grail. Now we'll go into the non-ordinary states of consciousness. They refer to the psychological states or experiences that differ significantly from the normal waking state of consciousness. And they're characterized by alterations in thinking, sense perception, emotional expression, and self-awareness. We all get it while going into sleep, in, uh, we're very busy in doing something. We all go into these non ordinary states of consciousness day in and day out. Now, they can be induced by various means, including meditation, trance induction, sensory overload or deprivation, psychological stress, hypnosis, use of psychedelic or psychoactive substances. Some of them can be very robust, very deeply emotional and very dramatic. Some of them, if they happen, they can lead to profound personal changes, so-called awakenings. So this is the importance of the non-ordinary states of consciousness. So a few examples. Now there's a very active interest in using psych psychedelic group of components. I'll come to it later in psychiatry and also other neuro um, neurological sciences. And they have shown very some dramatic responses. For some people, lifelong suffering from anxiety, depression, after a single dose of psychedelic substance, when they have a good trip, the so-called trip, they get cured. And but there's a, a lot of studies going on and there's an uh, analysis, meta-analysis uh, uh, published recently that showed, yes, it, it, ex it exists and it can be long-standing. How? We are slowly understanding how it can be possible. The other thing happens with a technical hypnosis, uh, which we'll come to later again. Now, hypnotherapy is proven a lot of therapeutic benefit. One of them is the one area my expertise is, is functional neurological disorder, previously known as hysteria, or conversion disorder, or dissociation disorder. Now we call them functional neurological disorder. There are a lot of neurological symptoms, but when you scan their brain, everything is fine. And hypnosis, this is one of the group study, one of my colleagues, they published that people with functional stroke, so-called stroke, because they presented just like stroke, but the brain didn't have stroke. They had weakness, speech problem. With single session of hypnosis, there's a profound response. They improved immediately, and this was long lasting. This, this I have seen in a couple of patients. They're like magic. They cannot talk, cannot speak. After a session of hypnosis, they go home. That's it. What happens? We're coming to understanding more and more about it. But the main thing is that this is one of our non-ordinary states of consciousness that can give profound change. And next is one of my hypotheses, I'm working on it. Some of our trance states can give profound life changes. And one of the examples I found is Swami Vivekananda, when he met Ramakrishna Paramahansa, his guru, and he had one trance event, very clearly described. And after that, his life changed completely. And it changed the direction of our religious movements, of our cultural movements, not only of Bengal and also part uh, uh, India as well, to something different. Before that, Vivekananda was a, uh, almost an uh, agnostic, and he changed completely to a uh, uh, devoted Hindu and religious leader. So uh, any non-ordinary states of can, uh, consciousness can have some profound change. So first coming to meditation, because meditation is one of the things that is practiced at 
across the cultures. If you can look at this, that the Indian meditation uh, traditions from Vedic yoga, Buddhism, the Chinese tradition, where it is inspired by Buddhism, to Japanese tradition, then Western tradition has their own tradition. It's much more scripture based, like all other Abrahamic religion, uh, some uh, mystic sect of both Judaism and Islam have their um, traditions of uh, meditation and the current Westernized traditions, the mindfulness of the transcendental meditation. Now we can broadly, uh, broadly classify them into two. First thing is the focused attention and the open monitoring. So the focused attention meditation is that you concentrate on a given internal external object and whenever the attention decreases or whoever away, you bring it back to it. The other, other open monitoring, it is uncontrolled observation or the stream of experience. They come and go, you let them go. So this is the main two types of meditation, the classification types, of, and there's overlap between different group of meditation. And the classical Yoga Sutra Pratanjali has described it, uh, the six steps from Pratyama to Samadhi. There's a classic description we know about meditation. Now, meditation has a lot of new remaining study done. One of the highest um, studies that have done been done in non this ordinary state of consciousness meditation. We can see the findings are quite common. We see activation of precuneus, this area which is processed self-relevant information, which is important for me. The anterior cingulate cortex in processing again self-regulation and adaptive behavior. Insula, so-called hub, or one connection is connected all over all over part of the brain. It's interoception, meaning how my internal state is doing. Am I being fearful? It is internal monitoring. It's always, our brain is always monitoring our internal self. So this part is very important, interoception. And also activates the premotor cortex and superior frontal gyrus, processing the experiential or the inactive self. So I am looking at myself and experiencing it. It's a little bit different from interoception, but that process of looking back at myself is controlled by the uh, superior frontal gyrus. And also the angular gyrus where we keep on using to reorient attention. If our attention is moving away, we keep on using this part of the brain's get activated when you move it back. So these, so across all different types of meditation, we can see this group of set of brain regions getting activated and they have their clear control defined. Now meditation, if you look over the years, there's explosion in research in meditation. You can see the number of citations climbing up, number of uh, publications come climbing up more and more. We're using the meditation. We know how to use it, when to use it. And there are some people in whom meditation is not that effective. We also know that now. Now, this is the top 15 cited studies in meditation and that use from, there's a lot of use from using different psychiatric condition, from neurological condition, fatigue control and other issues. Meditation are useful now, we know. Now coming to the hypnosis. So hypnosis is a process in which one person gives suggestions to another person for imaginative experience involving alterations in perception, memory, or action. So where there's a deep state of relaxation, after that, someone gives a suggestion what to do. In some other hypnosis form, the suggestion can be indirect or can be self-generated. Sorry. So the hypnosis originated in ancient Egypt, the so-called sleep temples. People used to go through them. They were given sensory overload by smell, uh, visuals and other thing, and they were hypnotized. Then Franz Mesmer, the first proposed or codified the practice of hypnosis. Initially, it was about, he told about animal magnetism, later proved wrong. And one of the people who proved wrong was Abbe Feria. Now, again, there's a deep Indian connection because Abbe Feria was a Guanese. He was a Guanese Catholic, but his family came from Goa, they were originally from Goa, and he transferred the knowledge of hypnosis in so called the Pakis and the sadhus, there is some steps of self-hypnosis practiced in the yogi practice. He took it to the Western world and introduced. And then James Braid coined the term hypnosis. And Emil Ku is one of the proponent of making hypnosis popular. And this someone will know this terminology every day and every way I'm getting better and better. This is one of the motto we give in when it was used in child as a self-help. So this is a, one of the steps of self-hypnosis actually. Again, we have the different types, traditional hypnosis, Ericksonian hypnosis, where the suggestion is indirect. There's cognitive behavioral hypnotherapy, which we use in people with, pay, people with different issues. Then regression hypnotherapy, where hypnotherapy takes back to your memory lane. Because hypnosis can activate some latent memories to find out what happened and sort out the problem which happened in the past. And solution-focused hypnotherapy is very popular, like you have some smoking cessation, weight loss, and other things. 
people can use those hypnosis for the specific situations. And the neuro-linguistic program is an offshoot of hypnosis, very common, quite popular, especially in corporate cycles. People have workshops with neuro-linguistic pro programming. It's a basic combination of self-help and motivational speech. Now, hypnosis was used at one time by neurologists. So this is Shamai Sharko, who was the forefather of neurology, using hypnosis in people with functional neurological disorder. History is known to them. But it later proved to disuse. There's a lot of controversy. There's one people who claim that under hypnosis tried to kill another person. So it went into disrepute. And because of the show, kind of the showmanship of the hypnosis, Sharko is also um, used to do it. And he has a lot of female patients who are put into hypnotic trance, do, do some bizarre things. So those are the olden days and uh, some bad clinical behavior. So they fall into disrepute and hypnosis went away. Now it is making a comeback. We are now resurrecting, making out of the myths and the, all the stage hypnosis now we know, and we're bringing to it proper therapeutic uh, potential, we're using more and more. So what happens during hypnosis? As a person goes into the hypnosis, the first thing, the subject relaxed and the focus on something, it can be moving pendulum or some you know, separate point or just close their eyes, focus on the voice. And there is a reduced activity in dorsal anterior cingulate. So or the self-monitoring comes down. Then there is a decreased connectivity between dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex and the default mode network. This is very important. The default mode network is the self-monitoring stream going on actively whenever we try to come down our mound. This is disconnected. Again, the self-monitoring goes away. Now the brain becomes open to suggestion and it puts the suggestion in activity by increased connectivity in dorsal lateral PFC and insula. Where we focus on our body, our monitoring, what we need to do, so to put the suggestion to work. So again, because of the variability in hypnosis, the studies are somewhat variable, but this is the basic structure we have seen. So we lose what is so-called the ego dissolution. We lose our control of ego. We, we let it go. And then we take in some suggestion what to do about our fears, things that we need to do. Now, again, hypnosis is emerging as a tool for a lot of things. One of them is pain control. So many people with chronic pain, now we know because it exists in the brain, the brain network gets altered and hypnosis can change it back. And also hypnosis coming a big way in my field called functional neurological disorder is one of the most effective tool developed so far because some people can be refractory functional seizures and other group and hypnosis is quite helpful for them. Now, this is a lot of work and I'm part of it actually. We're doing to find out how to make hypnosis more effective, more generalizable, more approachable to people. Now, this question asked by one of my friends, what is the common between hypnosis and meditation? I was discussing with Rita Brothi asked this question. So this Rita Brothi, if you're here, this slide is for you. Yes, they are common, but there are differences as well. So some part of the hypnosis, the dharana and dhyana, they are similar, and, but some part are different. Like there is no suggestions, given suggestions, if you, and the different brain activity also similar, but somewhat different. So they are, again, Similar in some part, different in other part. That's why the effect is somewhat different. I come to the psychedelics. It is an emerging and very important role for all other activities. Now, psychedelics are the group of drugs, are hallucinogenic drugs, which primary effect is to trigger so-called the non-ordinary mental states and for psychedelic experience or trips and an apparent expansion of consciousness. People expand what they feel. They get new kind of feeling, they get new kind of understanding. This is what we call so-called psychedelic experience. The main psychedelics are mescaline, LSD, psilocybin, and the DMT. And all of them act via the HT2A receptors. Now, this is a long tradition in different cultures, from Indian to Mesoamerican cultures, the use of psychoactive substances and psychedelics. Specifically, it was very highly developed in South America, the ayahuasca, use of ayahuasca was ritualized. Now it has abuse potential and other health risks. So we are very cautious about using, going to use it, non-use and bad trips are a possibility. Many people understand going through the psychedelics, their experience may not be good. The experience may be bad and maybe particular bad, they can get worse. So this is another possibility. So sometimes psychedelic so-called trips are guided So one of the prominent elements of psychedelic experience is visual alteration. So you people say that this is one of the one of the artists 
draw you drew a picture after a psychedelic trip. So the colors are more vivid. You can see new kind of colors. Your patterns keep on changing. You see some thoughts connected, which you never thought can be connected. Kind of like a vivid dream, more vivid, more real. People say it is hyper real. And there's a mystical experiences. There's a, you feel oneness, which is beyond you, something. And if you look, if you discuss carefully, look carefully back, the concept of Ananda is also discussed about the oneness, the Buddhist tradition, that is the ultimate. Psychedelics can take us to that ultimate goal of the meditation. That actually, it comes from, now we are understanding, it is comes from ego death, because it also shuts down the default mode network. So your ego, which is always monitoring your things, shuts down. So psychedelics has, again, similar to meditation, partly similar to hypnosis, but there are some other aspect of psychedelics as well, this profound sensory phenomena, which is not seen in other kind. Now we know why it's happening. So you can see for social cognition, these are the brain areas activated. Here is the uh, precuneus, the frontal lobes, similar for the theory of mind, which means the my action is mine and your action is yours. This is concept of theory of mind. And here is the default mode network. So these are the brain areas get activated when you look at them. Now, after psychedelics, when the overlap, it can see, you can see it overlaps with our social cognition and also our theory of mind. So psychedelics, while well, they shut down the default mode network, it impacts our social cognition. That's why we become bigger than us, become part of the whole. And also we lose that what belongs to us and what belongs to others. So psychedelics gives a lot of this hallucinogenic experience. We feel the feelings are coming, but they are not created by us. So the so-called hallucinations. So that's why this kind of thoughts and other things are coming. The use of psychedelics that we understand it now. So psychedelics can give us that feeling. And this is very profound. People who have under, undergone psychedelics therapy, as we discussed earlier, they can have profound change. They're, and people have described taking a good trip is that it resets the brain. There are many reports available, people struggling with anxiety, depression after a single psychedelic trip, as if somebody has reset their brain. Things are fine now. Now coming to the other uh, non related states of consciousness is trance. Now trance is associated again with ego dissolution, but again, prominent sensory and addition motor alteration. And it is very common. We all have some experience of mild trance, either listening to a music, uh, engrossed, and flow state is one of the say, early phase of trance. We're driven by visual, auditory, kinesthetic stimuli, and use of psychiatric substance are common in different rituals we have for generate this trance. And use for healing purposes common in cultures. There are so-called the ojhas, the jhar books, they use some kind of trance mechanism, where sometimes they go into themselves into trance. I'm coming to it. And there's something called battle trance. The soldiers throughout the uh, civilization goes into the mental state. When they enter, they do not feel fear or pain. And they lose their individual identity and acquire a collective identity. And then it was used in certain cultures, um, like the Bedouin culture, or uh, use of opium um, as in the, during the battlefield. It was very common. Now, the other group of very co most commonly studied trance practices are called shamanic trance. So the people themselves go into trance and use that state to do something else. So this is called shamans, the superpowers, they're called, they call them the animal powers. Now, there are different kinds of trance getting studied. They're called ecstatic trance, in which the shaman spirit purportedly leaves the body and communicates with animal or other spirits in other domains. The possession trance, in which animal or other spirits enter the shaman's body, sometimes to exclusion of his own self, and dreamlike trance. And the shaman remains in a position of the self and meets animal, other spirits in a shared domain. So again, you can see the oracle of Delphi. So possibly it was a dreamlike trance. And there the soothsayers, the soothsayers, they use this kind of dreamlike trance to answer our future questions. So it, was, it has been part through human culture through a journey. In a common trance experience, the left side is the one trance phenomena seen in Bengal. I think the time is coming up for Chorok festival, it happens during this period. So people go into trance and they have some, do some superhuman feat because people become resistant to pain during the trance period. And there's also documentation that body power increases before they, uh, they can do it voluntarily. 
the other thing trance is common in music festivals people go into trance now one woman i am coming to her later has changed how we understand trance. So she's one pioneer so-called self-induced cognitive trance. And with her help, we are studying this phenomena more and more. So we find how the consciousness, hemispheric laterality and systemic psychobiology changes during trance. So we have found trance is kind of branch of our ordinary self or consciousness. So the trance self branches out from the normal self in a pathological hyper-absorbed rest. And there's a focus, it starts the focus attention. You have to focus the attention, then it branches out to a pathological or hyper-absorbed. Then you are more focused. It is a kind of uh, paradoxical, but you get absorbed as you get more focused. And it is different from the normal dreaming. And you can see the laterality shifts to the right or sensory motor self. That's why the motor, our sensory perception changes or motor activity changes. And it becomes a trans self or attractor and kind of experiential self. From the analytical self, we get an experiential self. Again, the ego dissolution happens. Our default mode network shut down, shuts down. So this is something we're understanding now. So this is the lady, her story is very unique. So she is a, she's a born French, she was in the UK, and with part doing a BBC documentary, she went to Mongolia. So she, they, she was recording the shamanic uh, trance states of the Mongolian shamans. And during such procedure, she herself went into the trance. The shaman stopped the process, told this is not good. Because if one shaman is having presence of another shaman, the shaman need to be informed. And she told, no, I am not a shaman. But then they asked, then why did you go into trance? This was the first time it is happening to me. By listening to the drum bits, the, the shamanic trance in Mongolia is with auditory stimuli. They use the traditional drum bits in a rhythmic fashion and they go into trance. So she herself went into trance into a so-called the wolf figure. You can uh, study her. There's a very well-documented videos on her on YouTube. Now, after that, she learned how to do it without using the drum. And she's training it now, so self-induced cognitive trance, and she's her group very active in trans-related research. And again, if they have a lot of powerful activity, anti-anxiety and other mood boosting activity. Again, this is like similar to use of psychedelic without use of any psychedelic agent. So this is one area of research is getting very active now. So towards the new future, the credit goes to chat GPT and Daily. I ask them to produce a picture, they give me this picture. <laughs> so how can we use our brain to go, to go towards a new future? This by so-called synergy. So now we know how we study our brain, coming to the picture on the right, that we used to investigate so one person is experiencing subject who is going through the experience and we studied them before and after. So we studied which brain states are getting. Now we know the journeys are not that simple. They go through different phases. Again, the traditional Indian meditation technique has very clear identification of the phases. They go through these phases. And also the shamanic trans practice, they have different names for these phases. And then they reach somewhere and they might be variable. They may not be different for different persons. So now we are getting idea of taking the concept of the individual experience more and more in our research and we're quantifying it better and we're identifying more and more different group of brain networks they are activated because all if individual is different so involvement of the brain networks are also different across the individuals so we're understanding more and more and now we are also combining other things with new imaging we are having the concept of the higher order interactions on different brain part and we're using different techniques for it. And we are studying the, not only the brain. Brain is only part of it. There are other autonomic nervous system. They're also a big part of our cognition. So now we are understanding how autonomic nervous system may be a parallel kind of processing things. And it has to be responsible for some of cognition. Correcting it is correcting cognitions. And also stress related to getting better biomarkers for stress, we are studying them. We're studying that gut microbiome is associated richly with our understanding. So gut is called the second brain. So we are understanding more and more these issues. And so we're taking together. So we're partly taking account of other things happening other side of the brain because they're connected with the brain. And we're combining both them together to find how to go about these other conditions. So this synergy is happening now. 
So Bon Kim comes back again. So now he answers again. What should I do with my life? And there's Lord Kitchener coming back. Give the book the answer. Your life needs you. So you should decide what you do with your life. And there are a lot of tools available now. So you can decide, build some landmarks, get with other people, motivate them, build some landmarks for centuries to remain, or do art, whatever you like, or go explore the world, or currently outside the world. We're going to moon and Mars, maybe outside the universe, or do something big, collect, be rich, and uh, change things. Some people say uh, they're not good at all. Then do good to the world, maybe a small way, a big, big action like the mountain man, Dashrat Maji, the Jivan Pine, the forest man who created forest in Assam by single-handedly. So do whatever, do good. So thank you for the patience listening. And if you ask me what is my bliss, this is my childhood place, Shiliguri and Darjeeling, where on a bright, clear day, seeing this Kanjinjanga massive or the sleeping Buddha structure, this is bliss for me. Thank you, everyone. Good time for questions. And uh, thanks to R Professor Rita Broto for his slide, The Structure of Ananda. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Uh, so there is, uh, there, I think we have enabled chat now. So as, as in when we yeah. get questions, I can ask them to you. And meanwhile, from our offline audience, we have one question from, yes, uh, so this is Simrit, uh, a student of ours who is asking, which hypnosis method is the most evidence-based and has a promising future as a neurological intervention? Yeah, uh, this is a good question. So the most evidence-based is on traditional hypnosis method. And the Ericksonian also has some other evidence-based. But we do not much that differentiate much. Uh, so uh, the effect is almost same, but it depends on certain situation because now hypnosis is introduced part of the psychotherapy. The most common approach for use is kind of cognitive behavioral hypnotherapy or the psychotherapy. The hypnosis is part of the psychotherapy. So hypnosis is taken at the part of the tool and the overall psychotherapeutic anal analytic psychoanalysis, and then we use hypnosis as a tool. So it is a uh, combination thing and the evidence is coming up. And the, but again, what's the most robust evidence is for mainly for the current, mm, because it is studied more, the traditional hypnosis techniques. Okay, thank you so much. We have uh, uh, Mr. Ashutosh Ghosh who has, ra has raised a hand. Uh, so everyone can unmute themselves and ask the question to the speaker directly. Those who are online, those who have joined over Zoom. Can unmute okay, themselves seen, and ask. One question from Dr. Bishwajit Basu. Okay. So the question is, what is the key point, point difference in mindfulness meditation and hypnosis? Okay. So this I discussed earlier. So the main difference is that hypnosis, the deep relaxation is used by someone. It is more guided. So someone guides you to the relaxation technique. And mindfulness meditation, it is a more what we call open monitoring. You, as things come and go, you just monitor, you don't react. But hypnosis is much more focused. You focus on something, they are given an imagery, usually an imagery. The imagery contains a lot of visual stimulation and also gustatory motor. They ask you to say, you are in a beach. Now go down the beach, feel the sand, feel the water. You are looking at the bright blue sky. So these are the imagery are created in hypnosis. And you, as you go down and down, you get more hypnotized. So this is more focused. Mindfulness is more open, and this is guided, this is unguided. So it's a little bit different. And we can see in the network studies, they're a little bit different as well. So do we have any more questions? Yes, there's one more. Yes, this is Dr. Atri Chatterjee. Yes, so uh, Atri's question is, I'll read it for everyone, interesting question. So are there any studies in long-term changes in structure function of the brain among subjects who repeatedly attain NOSC? Yes, so this again comes from hypnosis meditation. 
So there are a group of meditative subjects in whom we have seen the part of the brain, they actually increase the thickness. So if the regular who do meditation, part of the brain is for compassion, other things, they're more thicker than others. And we understand this might be protective, actually protective against some form of dementia. So Dr. Bissajit Bashu, adverse effects of meditation on physical body. Uh, so far, we have not found anything. So far, we have not found any adverse effect. I'm not aware of any adverse effect of meditation. I'm not aware of, about it. So Dr. Rita Brotamitra is asking trans equal to trans. I'm not sure about the question. Can you be a little bit more clear? Professor Mitra? Any other question from the audience in the auditorium? Uh, so far, there's no other question. I think uh, what he's referring to is, uh, if I may, it's referring to transcendence equal to trans, if I understand correctly. Yeah, no, transcendence and trans is different. So trans is much more uh, personal and transcendence when the social cognition breaks down, you become part of the whole and also the other. So there are two different phenomena. Trans has a lot of other things, a lot of sensory phenomena going on, okay. increasing in reality, increasing part. But again, part of the transcendent. So the transcendence phenomena, so-called we know, it is a complex phenomena. If you phenomenologically analyze it, it will involve social cognition, it will involve your ego dissolution. There are two or three things going on when you lose yourself and become a part of the whole. There are two or three uh, components, so psychological component, the brain circuit is getting affected. Yeah, so Professor Ritopatru Mitra is actually mean transformation trans, not transcendence. Transformation trans. Transformation trans. So yes, so, tra so trans can cause transformation, but again, these are not well studied so far. But uh, yes, people who go in repeated trans phase, they go through a period of transformation. The people who have practices, they say they get transformed and they can then the so-called higher, they, they belong to the so-called, they get part of the so-called higher power. But again, these phenomena are not studied enough. So difficult to comment. Okay. So, Professor um, Bishwajit Basu is asking if anyone undergoes any faulty technique of meditation, will it cause any adverse effect? So, I think you have already answered, but yeah. Yeah. So, the question is what is a faulty technique? Yeah. Oh, Dr. Mitra is asking whether Nirvana is Pseudo Vedanta. No, this is a very. Uh, a very difficult issue. Now we will going into kind of cultural discussion. I will avoid it because this is a group of people who believes in Nirvana, group of people who denies Vedanta, we accept it as is. I will not go into the discussion. Okay. Uh, so I don't think we have any more questions from the audience, offline audience. So, so thank you, Dr. Das, for joining us and, uh, and for the enlightening session. You have uh, talked about different types of meditation, the brain areas involved, and also what could people, what could actually we do as people with our lives? And uh, yeah, so it was really enlightening for all of us. And I yeah, apologize so for the technical problems at our end. Yeah. And we couldn't, you, I guess you can cannot even see people at the other end. So, yeah. but still, uh, it was a very, very nice talk and so grateful to you for agreeing to be our uh, speaker. It's an yeah. honor for so, Gandhi College. Uh, thank you to uh, Professor Rita Brata Mitra. He shared the slides. Rita Brata, I cannot sh show them now because this is on a different computer and we're running out of time. But thank you for because the slides that I shared about uh, the Ananda, it was shared by uh, Dr. Mitra. I'm just sharing my slide once more. He's asking me to share them. Just hold on. So can can you see my screen? Or I need to just share it here. No, we cannot. Okay, share my screen.
yeah yes. so the, so so this beautiful slide was created by uh, dr vasarita brutamitra he's a famous poet in bengali as well thank you everyone thank, thank you. you so much thank you so much we'll end the session here yeah okay, okay. thank bye. you so much my bye, bye.